Excellent. So we're back at the, the ThingsCon uh, conference in, uh, in Amsterdam 2016. Um, we have a new guest. Uh, he's been doing workshops for two days. So who are you and, uh, and what do you do? Um, my name is Dries Druk. I work at the creative agency Studio Dots in Belgium. Uh, and here at ThingsCon, I've been running a workshop together with Ricardo Brito of Futurist. And this workshop was all about uh, ideation. So we were trying to figure out which ways can we support people in design, people in development, people in business to come up with IoT concepts. Did you hear any new and brilliant concepts today? That's a bit of the tricky thing with this type of workshop. So you have a two hour slot in which you try to have a group go through a process. Um, and it's not that we expected groundbreaking things to happen. So it was all more getting to know what is this tooling about? Like, what's the toolkit about? How can I use it? And, and therefore, I must say I didn't see any like uh, totally different ideas than I saw in other workshops coming out of this. I, I think that happens quite often. People need to go through this process a, a couple of times before they start getting real new things and new ideas. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think it's also like this uh, place is, ex is excellent to get to know, okay, this tooling might be interesting. Like I, I can use this in my practice. And then what I see happening is that once people in design, for instance, actually start using the tools, they will never use the tools as described and they will <laughs> fit it to their own, um, their own use, to their own practice, which is what it is all about, I think. Like, uh, we're only giving some ways of this is how you can use it, and then we see in practice that people, they, they put their own flavor to it, which is, which is great, which is excellent, yeah. And these workshops and the methodology you used can be used uh, for, for any kind of technology or, or ideas. Uh, um, but we are at an Internet of Things uh, uh, conference. So, so what is your relationship with Internet of Things? Um, yeah, so at Studio Dot, where I do, uh, where I work, the, I, I actually lead the research department. And one of the things that we try to focus on, we come from an industrial design background. So very mechanical stuff, very things that you can touch. Um, and we're trying to, tra more and more we're transitioning to digital products the design as well. Uh, and for us it's very much a process of trying to figure out as a design company, how do we do this? How do we do this on a process level? Like, what needs to happen? What do we need to make clear to the people that we collaborate with? Because in-house we do not have any development. So when we do something digital, whether it's electronics or whether it's uh, something on screen, interface kind of things, it will always be with an uh, external party. So we really need to figure out, we know a lot about hardware, we know a lot about how to do the mechanical side of things. It has its process, which is usually not as rapid as a digital process. Um, and then you get something, di someone digital in, uh, who is used to doing a lot faster iterations, for instance. And then we need to figure out, like, where do we position ourselves? And that's where, why I am doing that type of research uh, in the you know, where digital and physical comes together. I still think we can somehow name that IoT maybe. Um, I try to figure out what tools or what stuff, what methods can we introduce to bridge that gap. Well, so you already touched upon it uh, and the definition of uh, no IoT. So, uh, and there's, there's as many definitions as, as people here are, are things. What, what, what is your definition of uh, the Internet of Things? I can only think of Things, uh, but come to mind. <laughs> think, uh, the things that come to mind first are like what it's not. Um, and I probably have this thing that there's a lot of gadgets out there. Like, uh, and what I basically what I what I use to explain what I think is important in IoT. There's three different parameters that you need in some kind of concept or an idea. Um, the first one, which is often overlooked, is uh, physical distance. Uh, a lot of IoT products, they focus on a context of use, which is sometimes, for instance, the, the home environment. Uh, and then a lot of focus is on the home. And we're still using the internet. Um, and then it can be interesting to question yourself. I can maybe do something on the other end, on the other end of the planet. Um, does that make sense to do it? That's, of course, a question. But this aspect of distance is something that is somehow not always taken into account. The second aspect is um, a logical step in data that is being collected. Like you see often in these gadget-driven IoT products that there is a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, 
um, action. So like an input triggers an output. I push a button, something happens. A, center, a sensor detects something and it will send me a notification. I think that's too shallow. Um, and the potential of this IoT uh, that thing that is happening is that you can use data which you collect with a, from a sensor, for instance, and reinterpret that, like have an algorithm go over that data and, and do something more with it. Um, which I think is also something that it, it's not easy to come up with that type of ideas, but it's something that is, I think, es essential to calling something IoT. And the third one, uh, third aspect is uh, network complexity, I would like to call that. Uh, so network complexity comes down to being able to use um, measured data sources, for instance, from sensors, uh, together with external data sources, for instance, from APIs coming from city data, for instance. You can use combined weather data with me sitting on this chair. Um, and that combination, that complexity that you can introduce in such a concept, it's also something which is not easy to do. But when you bring together more data streams, more data sources, more actors in a complex thing, so not this if this then that kind of stuff, um, then it becomes interesting, I think. I, I think I think so too, but uh, but I haven't seen many examples of these kind of kind of things. No. Maybe maybe you've seen some more because you're doing research about this all the time. There are not a lot of examples. I think there are a couple of good examples in the exhibition of the Just Things Foundation here, um, and I, one that I would like to highlight, not because it's a Belgian company, but um, uh, there is something um, in Belgium. There's a company called June, uh, and they're working on energy. Um, and their idea is to uh, you, you give them full control over the el el energy provider which you are subscribed to. And depending on your usage, which is what they track using their device, um, they switch your energy provider based on your uses, usage and the prognosis of the energy that you've been using. So electricity and gas, I think, is focusing on. So I think that's an example of where this for an end user, you get an overview of, okay, this is like a graph of my usage, which seems to be just very, um, like just tracking something. But on the other hand, the data is being acted upon by an algorithm or a computer system, which somehow decides something based on that. So that there is not only one action that is being taken, but there are more actions that are being triggered by the same data set, if that makes sense. It, it does, and uh, but it also touches upon another aspect that a lot of people talk about here, and that is uh, uh, security, privacy, and those kind of things. And then how do I know that this algorithm is actually making the right decisions for me and switching from uh, or to Electrobel because uh, um, yeah. uh, supposedly that's the best offer at that moment? How do you do that? That's what I uh, I wonder too. Like um, I, I myself, I person for myself, more a personal. Um, home environment, I subscribe to that service to figure that out. Like, how will I experience that? A system deciding that for me. I, I don't really know. I put my trust, it's all about trust. I think trust is somehow the, the central issue there. I put my trust in this company who will then decide for me. Um, and then I'm not really sure what I have to think about that right now. Uh, and I think it's one of those evolutions that are happening now, which I think you can only experience by trying it out. True. Did, did you ask them? I didn't. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, because I probably was too excited about the service offering just to try it, try that out. Yeah. No, but uh, it's also, it seems to be that, that uh, in, in many of these uh, applications and, and new, new services, etc., that the deal concept of privacy, etc., etc., is, is not automatically included in the design mm -hmm. process, but just basically happens afterwards, uh, uh, and people seem to be a little bit surprised by the fact that they get questions about it, or, yeah. uh, uh, they say, just trust us, but the trust has to be earned these days, uh, yeah. um, and so, so why is that? Um, it's indeed something, as you very correctly mentioned, it's not taken into account at design time, uh, and it was also a comment during the ideation workshops, which we have been running to, uh, to two days. Um, that it would be interesting so to when you are creating this idea or this the outcome of the workshop was it was a system mapping like what are the relationships between people um, objects and environments uh, and we were then very much focusing on how are you interacting is it pushing buttons is it opening doors is it getting data from somewhere but then the comments 
that was very correct from the from the audience was like, okay, it would be interesting now to think about what's the privacy layer on top of this, what's the ethics layer on top of this, um, which is for me a very good outcome of the workshop that. People in design, which are present at this conference, are indeed concerned about that uh, and are indeed looking for ways to include it at design time and not as an afterthought. Well, I heard it many times today too, and I think it resonates also uh, amongst more people, but designers. I think there's also uh, other young people, especially, that are, that are more and more worried about it and, and, and trying to include that into their businesses or jobs or whatever they do. Uh, but it's still still a small group of people, and, and you don't have the feeling that the, the, the large corporations that are also playing a role in this field that they they include it. Uh, how how can we just make sure that they they change as well? I'm a pretty blank face right now. Um, it's going to be a, a journey. Someone who has to disrupt the market, perhaps. You see a lot of these blockchain initiatives happening. I'm not really sure, convinced that that will be the thing. Uh, you see these movements, I mean that's an example I could give. Um, I know for instance in, in city environments, like the city of Antwerp is an example, they're doing a lot of experiments with blockchain, with Ethereum, to do more respect-based um, payment systems more or less, uh, compared to um, capitalist-driven systems. Uh, and will that have a real impact on the short term? Probably not. Um, but the fact that I, when I saw the city of Antwerp, which is not really a big city, but nevertheless, uh, if a city is already experimenting with that, at least for me it was like, okay, they are aware that something is happening, that people are changing their idea or their belief about it. And maybe that's also the second thing, like, uh, there's quite a bit of work to be done on the bottom-up approach to, to this whole security and awareness of ethics and that kind of thing. Because when I talk to even some of my colleagues and I say, okay, you're still using Facebook, you have all this tracking turned on, are you aware of what is happening? And even the people that I work with day to day, they don't always realize what it is that they are sharing. I was, someone had to point me two weeks ago to the history that Google keeps of all the places that you've been. I was really amazed when I saw the visualization of that history, which I knew that they were keeping something, but if you, I, I think it's like google.com slash history or something, and you get day by day an overview of this is the route that you traveled, we think you did this by car, you were there at that location, um, seeing that and being confronted with that, I think it's something that's from the bottom up level also not present enough in, in, in the lives of people right now. No, but it's also because other people uh, are still not aware of the fact that this uh, could be a problem. Um, yeah, they, 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 they see it and they realize it sometimes, but they say, okay, so Google knows it, and so what? Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, from, a, from an awareness perspective, there's, there's two things uh, that need to happen. Probably uh, people need to know more about all the things that are being tracked uh, by all the different devices that they use and uh, so the data that are, uh, are collected and on also what can be done with it, what the impact of the collection of data is over time combined with etc uh, etc. Et so I think there's a lot of work to do on, on awareness but uh, um, surely impact. Yeah. So but uh, um, let's back to, to these, you said okay we uh, um, you could come up with many examples of, of successful IoT uh, uh, applications or products, etc., etc. Uh, and that's no problem because it's a young industry, but uh, uh, and usually things go in phases. Uh, uh, how do you see the IoT mm. now and what needs to happen for the next phase? Mm -hmm. um, well, just to get back to the first part of the statement, um, I think if you look back 10 years, for instance, a lot of these applications that are being commercialized now were more or less also existed at that point, I think. There's a lot of work that has been done in, in B2B sectors, like uh, warehouse automation, uh, people are doing L, um, they call it elevators, yeah, elevators. Uh, maintenance, predictive maintenance, and that kind of industries. I think there's a lot of the technical building blocks that are already out there. Uh, I think it's the, the next step is trying to 
make these technologies work with our everyday life. Uh, and you see, like one of the talks that I just attended was by Albert Chun on the uh, conversational interfaces. It's one of the ways that we are trying to make or embed that kind of technology, IoT kind of technology, in our everyday lives. Maybe chat is like a, a, do, a, a way to do it. But trying to figure out what are the ways to make it humane, maybe, or make it more fit suiting into our just day to day practice that we don't have to be aware of the smartwatch which which is buzzing all the time or the I don't know uh, some other kind of wearable that I need to keep track of, but that we can just I think that's what at least I am looking for often is to how can I embed this in my day to day life? Do I need to actively be occupied with using this product or is it more like attuned to my flow of living? Well, I talked talk to some people about this same uh, topic as well and uh, uh, so we came up with the ideas about, well, uh, should technology be just like a butler that knows what you want and uh, when you want it and, uh, and just be completely in the background. Uh, it is there but you don't notice it, you don't have to teach it, it will teach itself. Uh, but on the same at the same time, people say, okay, but it's also a bit scary and, uh, uh, if you have that, because how can you control it, how do you know whether the decisions uh, that are being made are not influenced by commercial interests of other companies, etc., etc., et do we want to have a relationship with technology in, in that way? Uh, um, so so what, what are your thoughts about that? Again, it probably comes down to trust um, and transparency is something that we've not mentioned, maybe. <laughs> um, I think... It reminds me of a project which I took, just completed in which we were doing stuff, IoT stuff in healthcare. Uh, and in there it was also the design principle, any type of data which is being collected should be made available in an understandable format to the any stakeholder involved. In this case it was seniors and their caretakers. Uh, and we actually designed and developed two visualizations of the same data in order to have these people access whatever we were collecting. Um, but I think there it was our responsibility as designers to come up with that principle. Um, so the, the role of, of the designer or the developer in taking responsibility for including that transparency in the design, again at design time, um, is probably more important than we might realize today. Are you, are you considering uh, 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 working with uh, or experimenting with uh, conversational interfaces or AI? Um, yeah, that we're, we're like trying to, <laughs> for the past year we've been trying to figure out what would a useful Slack bot do for our company instead of something that makes jokes uh, uh, and, and is funny. Um, and now we sometimes get to some good examples of a conversational slight bot or interface uh, and then we try it out in practice and then we always notice uh, okay our lifestyles are so different in the company that it's very hard to find something that really embeds with the day-to-day -day practice so we're experimenting trying that out seeing does this work yes or no but for now it seems very hard to script such a thing like, it's so hard to to, to, to know which steps you go through and does that suit me, does it suit my colleague, does it suit people at home. So it seems to be so different the way that we go about it with our everyday life. So. I can understand. Um, so uh, you've been around uh, the conference and you've been around in, in IoT. What, what is the, the most uh, exciting new thing or sensor or technology that you've came across and that you are really happy to, uh, to, to dig into? It's hard to pin that down to a technology. What I always admire in IoT projects is that they reuse old technology. Um, I think the deceased Berg um, a little printer was a good example of that, like using thermal printers, which are like have been around for over decades, um, but using that in a in a connected way uh, or, or reusing something that has proved that is proven and then using that in a different way. I'm always uh, 
Toronto, have you seen it? By, by that kind of uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and maybe the thing that I'm most excited about when it comes to IoT is what we've been talking about, what, been, what we have been discussing, this whole movement towards we need to be considerate about um, privacy aspects, we need to be considerate about security aspects from the humane perspective. So for me, that's also my my interests into doing that ideation stuff is to figuring out how can we create products that resonate with people. And don't let technology take the dominant hand, but try to figure out where is the entry point for something in everyday life, which is not easy. Which is not easy, but, but I think it was a great final words. Uh, uh, thank you for your talk. Okay. Uh, see you around. Okay, thank you.